it's just a delight to see so many old friends and new faces here today. And I thank Dr. Ammerling for giving me the honor of trying to cover the whole progressive train wreck since Medicare through Obamacare in only 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, of course, it started well before Medicare. And back in 1943, AAPS helped to defeat the Wagner-Murray Dingle Bill, which was the first effort to impose socialized medicine on the United States. And we should have applause for Curtis Kane and the other guys in the room who were involved <laughs> since way back when. I'm going to work backwards here, rather like a math problem, when you know what the answer has to be and you kind of work backwards to figure out how you may have gotten there. So I'm going to start with Obamacare. And I think it's very important for us to learn from the proponents of things like this. So I'd like to turn to Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize winner, who writes The Conscience of a Liberal, who is the New York Times famous or most favorite economist. And he wrote in the New York Times in November of 2010 an article entitled Death Panels and Sales Taxes. And he said, eventually, we will have to resolve our deficit problem, or it will be and should be resolved through death panels and sales taxes. He said, healthcare costs will have to be controlled and which will surely require having Medicare and Medicaid decide what they're willing to pay for. This is not really a death panel, of course, but we'll have to have a consideration of medical effectiveness and at some point how much we are willing to spend for extreme care. Now, Krugman thought that it wouldn't be until the first administration of Chelsea Clinton that we could get enough support for this so we could get a few more points of the GDP devoted to um, this, this project, but I think that we're a little ahead of schedule. And this is my favorite t-shirt, which is about Obamacare, death and taxes in one convenient package. <laughs> I'd like to say that APS, you can hold it up there, John, so everybody can see it. APS goes along with Twyla Bray's. We do not hedge. Some people say, well, we should look at Obamacare and try to pick out the good points which we can save. And I've read the whole thing, and I can say unequivocally there are no good parts in Obamacare. Also, I have to say that AAPS does not do pinprick attacks. And certainly, Andrew Schlafly does not do pinpricks. One example is the recent lawsuit by Hobby Lobby, which said we shouldn't be forced to pay for abortifacients. And we agreed with that, and we filed an amicus brief, and we're glad that they won, but that really is a pinprick. It has no effect on Obamacare as a whole, and it accepts the premise of all the thousands of other things that Obamacare is forcing people to pay for. Our moral problem with Obamacare goes much deeper than that. We're against things like lying and stealing. And Obamacare really is based on a false premise. It's based on deception. For one thing, it says that Obamacare is about insurance. But of course, it's not insurance. Insurance is a voluntary contract to compensate for catastrophic financial losses that any of these programs that have been promoted as national health insurance or universal coverage or, or universal insurance or something are all compulsory. And they involve a whole lot more than just paying you for catastrophes, but with organizing the whole enterprise of medicine, which is about one-sixth of the economy or one-fifth of the economy these days, and that really has a great spillover. And it's not insurance at all. Its proponents admit it is about the redistribution of wealth, which we call stealing, or legalized plunder, if you want to use Bastiat's term. And eventually, a license to steal inevitably turns into a license to kill. 
And we're beginning to see a little more and more about that. So AAPS a litigation against this. You know, we, we're in favor of repeal, of course, and we were in favor of defund, but the Republican Congress having abdicated its power, which is its power of the purse, we're having to rely on the legal means. And our cases to overturn Obamacare are intended to void the whole thing. Uh, because it is unconstitutional. We filed three days after it was signed into law. That case languished for a long time pending the outcome of NFIB. And Chief Justice Roberts handed us a great new weapon, which we hope Andrew can turn into a silver bullet, to be, to because he declared that Obamacare is a tax. And maybe this will give us a way to repeal it or to void it. We hear the Republicans now, instead of talking about repeal, and they've made some useless gestures on that behalf, to repeal and replace. Well, replace with what? Repeal what? I'd like to work a little backwards here. Um, because we have some past experience with sort of the repeal and replace with Clinton Care. We helped to defeat Clinton Care, so we thought. And I have two claims to fame. One is I did read Obamacare. And also, I did read Clinton Care. And then when I read HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, I found that I recognized it. It was a big chunk of Clinton Care, some of the very worst parts of Clinton Care, that were being passed by the Republican Congress. And it included such goodies as the Clinton-Gingrich sustained growth rate, this form of price controls. I think that that in a sense, a Clinton care was somewhat worse than Obamacare, and that I think it was even more draconian in its effort to rule out people actually paying for medical care themselves. You know, HIPAA brought in this huge funding for the health care fraud uh, task force, and all of these so-called privacy rules, which as Twyla has pointed out, are really disclosure rules. And they're not for protecting privacy, they're for protecting the financial institutions because of all of the financial information that is in the medical records that they would like to force you to put on electronic health records for the convenience of some two million authorized users. When we got, when our Clinton care lawsuit sort of and we got access to the records in the, uh, in the archive, we found a very important uh, note, a memorandum which we call the Zellman Memorandum, if you look on our website. And this was a little discussion about the little constitutional problem of what happens if you forbid people to spend their own money. Now, people talk about the right to medical care. Well, what Obamacare and Clinton care and all the rest is, is an obligation, a duty to for everybody to pay for everybody else's medical care with the loss of the ability to pay for their own, which turns medical care into a privilege, of course. You have the right, which means the privilege, to have whatever they say you're allowed to have. And the Zoman Memorandum brought up the point that, well, it just might be unconstitutional to forbid people to use their own property to enhance or save their own lives. Well, this brings us then to Medicare, which um, our member uh, Jeffrey Singer has called the mushroom cloud in a syllabus that he's going to be presenting at Arizona State University. The Medicare mushroom cloud back in 1965, which was the start of all of this cost inflation that now we have to figure out how to try to control. And in Medicare, Medicare patients already have essentially lost their right to buy medical services from any physician who's involved in the Medicare program. I know some of you are here today because of a lawsuit brought in about 1992 by Lois Copeland, a past president, and five of her patients, Stewart versus Sullivan, asking for the right of patients to reach into their own pockets and buy services that was supposedly covered by Medicare, or maybe not covered by Medicare, but they just couldn't get them in a timely and, and convenient manner. This was bounced out of court. The court really hates to have to deal with this potential constitutional question of do you still have the right to use your own money for health? 
And they said, well, there's really nothing in the law or the official policy that prevents patients from doing what they want to do. But still, although he dismissed the lawsuit on that ground, Medicare has enough power to intimidate that nobody really could take advantage of that. And now I think really Obamacare would like to achieve the same thing, that it's everybody in, nobody out, you can't use your own money to get anything extra, anything that's outside those guidelines. So that this, I think, is the, the biggest threat to medicine, and this is our strongest priority, to preserve your right to practice. Every one of you in here who will see a cash-friendly patient, even if you're not totally opted out of Medicare, you are part of our future. You are part of our defense against the total destruction of our profession. Because, you know, socialism can't stand the competition, so it really tries to stomp out the private sector. The little problem with that is, though, that if you totally stomp out the private sector, the country starves. And so if the, the uh, Soviet Union, when it collectivized agriculture, was totally dependent on these peasants who were allowed to keep a tiny plot of land, and they fed the country. And you, with your pr private doctors, are going to be keeping our patients and the profession of medicine alive in our country. Actually, I think that the, the outlook for our country at the present time is very, very grim. And I'd like to give a little bit of reason for hope and a little note from history. You've probably heard of Louis XIV, the second to the last Louis before Napoleon, who took the Sun King, who took the view, l'était c'est moi, I am the state. And perhaps that reminds you of somebody that we have today. And Louis also said, Après moi, le déluge. After me, the deluge. And indeed that happened. After the old order was overturned, we had the French Revolution, we had the Bolshevik Revolution, we had the attempt to establish the Thousand Year Reich, and now we have just creeping chaos and tyranny all over the world. And I did see this, this phrase rather neatly turned around in a German movie you may want to look up from 2006 called Gloomy Sunday. This was the name of a haunting melody which got to be known as the Hungarian suicide song because so many people seem to be playing it while they cut their wrists. But the heroine of this movie was saying, Nach der Sintflut wir. Instead of after me the deluge, after the deluge we. We will survive. We will continue. We will keep our country alive. In her case, it was just a little private enterprise restaurant, and the movie has a beautiful twist of poetic justice. That is very, very interesting. You know, people have, um, the proponents of Obamacare have been very much afraid that it might be declared unconstitutional, because if it is unconstitutional, then what about Medicare? Well, it's a very good question. That Medicare is unconstitutional also. And we're not proposing. <laughs> that we take Medicare away from our older people who have been forced to become dependent on it. But we need to recognize it for what it is, and we need to find an alternative for the future. We need to restore the republic. And if there's one, one other positive note I'd like to end on, it's with the very gloomy prophet, Jeremiah, who predicted the fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the Babylonian captivity. But he also prophesied that after 70 years, Jerusalem would be rebuilt. And he put his money where his mouth is, and he bought a field in a place that the Babylonians had already taken over. And it's written in Jeremiah, the 32nd chapter. And I commanded Baruch in their presence saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds and put them in an earthenware jar that they may last a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. That private property, the ability to own private property is a foundation of a just society and we have that on the highest authority, and we need to exert our right 
and exercise our right to private property for our own benefit, for our patients, and for the good of our country.